Good morning, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute. Before we do anything else, I want to congratulate you all, those of you who are back as alums, those of you who have family members who are receiving diplomas this weekend, and, and those of you who are receiving diplomas this weekend. It's such a privilege for me and for all of us at the Watson Institute to be able to share this weekend with you. Uh, you know, I, the Watson Institute was founded 25 years ago in 19. 91. And uh, I imagine if an event like this was done in 1991, we would probably be celebrating the triumph or at least the validation of liberal values, of the values that um, undergird, at least for many of us, modern democracy, and particularly the modern democracies of advanced industrial nations. And by those values, I mean values of tolerance and pluralism and rights and a limited state. And maybe we would have taken a triumphalist view at the time, or maybe even a skeptical view, but I think we would have had to acknowledge in 1991 and in the immediate years following that democracy seemed to be spreading across the world in places where many of us never would have imagined it possible, whether in Poland or Hungary or Turkey or Indonesia, you name the place. And today, 25 years later, I think many of us feel um, that something has happened. In each of the countries I just named, whether it's Turkey or Indonesia or Poland or Hungary, many of these underlying values of democracy, underlying values of enlightenment and liberalism are coming into question. And it's not just in Hungary and Poland and, and Turkey, but also in countries like Denmark or France or Germany or the United States, as many of us feel. The purpose of this panel today is to think about that phenomenon. In a couple of respects, I welcome my colleagues to um, say that I'm full of beans, so to speak, and that this phenomenon is really not sweeping the world. Or uh, I hope they'll help us to understand what really is the challenge to liberal values today. Why is it that so many people across so many different democracies from the United States to the world's largest democracy, India, why is it that so many people are challenging not just maybe the inability of a country to realize the liberal values upon which it's based, but rather they're challenging the ability of liberal values to solve basic problems of livelihood, of security, and of justice. Uh, I can't think of three better colleagues today to enlighten us and illuminate us, illuminate these topics for us than the colleagues that are here today. Let me introduce them very briefly, and then I will turn the floor over to them. Uh, Margaret Weir uh, is a professor of political science and international public affairs here at the Watson Institute. Margaret, as many of you know, is a political scientist and sociologist with great expertise on American political development, uh, comparative politics, comparative social welfare, and a variety of other topics that are, that, that are dead center relevant to the issues we're discussing today. Next to Margaret is Professor Ashutosh Varshney, who's the Saul Goldman Professor of International Studies and Social Sciences. Uh, Ashu also directs the Brown India Initiative here at the Watson Institute. The India Initiative has just um, matured and is combining with the South Asia program to found a new center within Watson, the Center for Contemporary South Asia. And next to Ashu is Professor Mark Blythe, uh, professor of Political Science and Political Economy, and Mark's expertise is on European affairs, financial affairs, and Mark, as many of you know, has done um, extraordinary work, most recently on issues of austerity. What I'd like to do at this point is turn the floor over to each of my colleagues in succession. We'll start with Margaret, and then Ashu, and then Mark, and then we'll open it up to questions for all of you. Thank you. Margaret. Uh, do you have the telephone? There we go. It's on the desktop file. We just need to click the file. Good morning. So uh, Ed gave us a hard task. Uh, big question, short time, early in the morning. So I'm going to uh, do my best here. Um, and I thought about his question is, is American democracy on the defensive? Uh, is there a turn to illiberalism when it comes to civil rights and civil liberties in the U.S. And when you think about this in the American context, um, in a way, 
we are the democracy with the most stable institutions over a long period of time, Britain and the U.S. And you think, I was just thinking as I was walking over here, the Upton Sinclair, It Can't Happen Here, that old novel. And it leads us to think that our fundamental institutions, they can't really be in any real jeopardy. And political science research, in a way, backs this up. Political science research shows that rich democracies since 1950, uh, looking over all rich democracies, have not backslid to authoritarianism. So we have some, some indicators that, that we're okay. But the United States is a stable democracy in which illiberalism has historically played a fundamental role uh, in the form of slavery, legalized racial segregation, denial of the vote in the South, nativism, anti-immigrant sentiment. So we are a strange democracy. And some people say we really didn't become a full democracy until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. So the question for today is, are we um, facing a renewed period of significant illiberalism in the United States? And, and is even our stable democracy in jeopardy? So these are big questions, and I thought I would present a few pieces of evidence that provide some, some, uh, some things to think over. So um, what I first want to do is give you some evidence from the, what's called the World Value Survey. This is a survey that's done in countries across the country and asks a variety of questions. And so this is, these are the answers to the questions about, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, how essential is it to live in a democracy? And what it does is it shows it by birth cohort. What you can see is that people who were born in interwar period, people born in the 30s, 40s, it is the highest value for them, up to 70% in the United States uh, above and rises um, after the experience of fascism and Nazism in, uh, in uh, other countries in Europe. Um, so that, but that starting in the 1950s, as you get birth cohorts born in these other eras, those saying that democracy is the highest value begins to decline. This is uh, rather sobering. Um, there's other evidence too, and I thought I'd, since it's early in the morning, this is from a TV show that I've managed to watch about three episodes of before I couldn't watch anymore, um, <laughs> uh, uh, that in the United States, 41% of the people born uh, in the interwar and the initial post-war decades, 41%, so near half, say it's absolutely essential for a democracy to protect civil rights and civil liberties. When you get to millennials, that falls to 32%. So on this issue of supporting civil rights and civil liberties, there's also something of a declining support. Another thing that people have become interested in is whether we have uh, rising support for authoritarianism. And that's answer to a question, this is again from the World Values Survey, uh, a good way to run the country is with a strong leader, not parliament and elections. And this is uh, responses just for the United States. Uh, and you can see, and this is over, um, uh, over time, not by birth cohorts, but you can see that support for this, you know, not, you know, pretty authoritarian question, strong leader and not parliament and elections grows. It is still 35% at its height. Uh, it is not half of the United States, but it is something that is growing. So this question about authoritarianism has come up uh, with regard to Trump. And if you go online, you'll find lots and lots of articles uh, about this and people trying to assess this. And, you know, interest in political science and authoritarianism uh, began after World War II, trying to understand the authoritarian personality, Nazi Germany, fascism. Uh, and it has revived in recent years, uh, in part because um, political scientists have become better at measuring the authoritarian personality through looking at things like uh, parenting practices. They have proxies for it. And so, uh, so what this debate is arguing is that uh, Trump is much more strong among people who score high on these authoritarian measures. So this is a very uh, hot topic. And so I want to 
don't worry, I'm not going to go on the whole time. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to uh, stop and then just ask, well, what do all these things in public opinion mean? Does it mean that suddenly Americans have become more authoritarian? So there's some latent part of our personality that's coming out. And I want to suggest that just looking at public opinion doesn't give us enough, that we need to look also at political institutions, how they're operating, how they're doing. And here, I would highlight a, a few things. Government in action, money in politics, and government responsiveness. And let me just briefly say a little bit about each of these. Um, and we have ample evidence that there's problems on each of these dimensions. And so one way that political scientists, there's debate about it, but there's one way that political scientists try to measure congressional, or they try to measure government action and they do it through the numbers of laws passed. And it is clear that we, for the last <coughs> 10 years, and it's gotten progressively worse, have um, a kind of a stalemate in Congress. The Congress isn't doing much, and in fact, sometimes when it doesn't do things, it does things like jeopardize our, our debt uh, ratings, et cetera, our ability to borrow money. So congressional stalemate is, uh, leads to this sense that politics, politicians can't do anything. But one thing they can do is they can raise money. So the idea that our politics is just saturated with money, that there's insiders who get more than other people do, and Congress doesn't even do anything. It's led to kind of a disgust with politics. And you see that, you see that every, it's, it's very widespread. Um, very hard for political scientists. Um, and then finally, to look at the policy influence of different groups. This is an old question in American political science, you know, who, influences policy, and so there's been lots of different ways to try to measure it. And um, this comes from a, an article that was published uh, two years ago in, in one of our main journals. And what these researchers did was that they took public opinion and the positions of interest groups and they correlated them with policies that actually got passed, big, big data set. And what they found is, um, that average citizens, this is on a scale from zero to one, that average citizens have very little um, uh, influence over policy, that what passes doesn't reflect their views. And this is both liberal and conservative. It's not like the people are more liberal. It goes both ways. Economic elites are the ones, and that's measured in the top 10 percent of the income uh, scale. Uh, get the most responsiveness and business interest groups, with mass-based interest groups like the AARP being uh, a little bit higher than the mass public. So this has led, I think, these kind of senses of government failing, <coughs> being attentive to rich people, has led to our unusual uh, election year with uh, two, you know, outsider candidates, Bernie Sanders on the one side and Trump on the other side. But I do want to say that Trump, in particular, is without parallel in um, modern, well, I guess you might agree with that, <laughs> modern American politics. You know, people have tried to think about what is he like, and they say Jack, Jack, Andrew Jackson, who may be losing his place on the $20 bill, uh, is, um, is perhaps the closest uh, analogy. But his, you know, he's, you know, his hair, all that is funny, but he really poses the specter that we could have a democratic election that leads to a is leading to a dangerous rise in illiberal rhetoric and can lead to government practices which will themselves undermine the idea that democracy is a, is a culture of civic engagement and a culture of collective problem solving. So to return to the first question, I think we have to take this threat to democracy seriously. So thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Ashley Barton. Where are we on the... <coughs> Sorry, that was... <coughs> this, is, this is not me. <laughs> End of slides. Skip. Skip? Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Thank you all for coming. Um, we know more about American democracy than Indian democracy, so I'll lay out the the uh, the map um, for you uh, much more than we had to do that Margaret had to do for American democracy. But let me start with the basic theme of my presentation, which is that India's democracy uh, can best be described as a paradox, um, a paradox which uh, whose two elements for the purposes of our discussion today are a continuing electoral vibrancy, but mounting liberal deficits. Um, and uh, the point that uh, Margaret made about income being the best predictor of democratic survival or democratic resilience is summed up here. This idea uh, is not new, but it is most carefully examined by Adam Shavorsky, a political scientist in NYU, and his colleagues. And their data set covered 141 countries since 1950, and they found that income was the best predictor of democracy. It correctly predicted the type of regime in 77.5% of the cases, and only in 22.5% it did not. And no other predictor, uh, note religion is one of these, right? No other predictor, religion, colonial legacy, ethnic diversity, international political environment is as good on the whole. And given this larger picture, worldwide picture, about democratic resilience, India clearly becomes an exception because it's still a lower middle income country. It is not a rich country. And, um, and so on page 87, Adam Shavorsky et al. said, the odds against democracy in India were extremely high. So with this background, um, let's look at the, the data on electoral vibrancy before we come to liberal deficits. And it's increasingly, uh, they're increasingly worrying quality. Since 1952, India has had 16 national elections, 357 state elections. And since 1992, it has also had elections for the third tier local level, three million local legislators are elected every five years, and a third have to be women by law. In 1952, which was the first parliamentary election in India, 81 million votes were cast. In 2014, two years ago, 555 million votes were cast. Turnouts have routinely um, gone in, into the 60s now. Moreover, until 1989, following mainstream democratic theory, the richer and more educated Indians used to vote much more than the poorer and the less educated. Since 1989, India has defied democratic theory. This is called the SES principle. The poor and the less educated have voted as much as or more than the more educated and the wealthier. The biggest uh, single weakness of India's electoral record is election finance. Um, it's murky, quite a bit of it, much of it is illegal. But it's also clear that while businesses finance elections in India, they're unable to determine election outcomes. Often the poorer parties win, state elections and, and na even national elections sometimes. So. Um, uh, that's the electoral vibrancy. It's theoretically surprising. As I said, uh, one more point about theory needs to be noted, that contemporary democratic theory believes that democracies can be established at low levels of income. That's not the surprise about India. But they do not survive at low levels of income. That's the surprising part. So the, the, the distinction drawn between establishment and resilience is what's relevant to us. So India has become the longest surviving low-income universal franchise democracy in history from it's 1952 through now, with, an, with 18 months of national democratic suspension between 75 and 77. That's the exception. And there are regional democratic suspensions in areas of insurgency. But those areas of insurgency have never affected more than 5% of the country's population directly. So this is a way, this, according to whether it's, it's Robert Dahl, uh, one of our foremost democratic theorists, or Adam Shavorsky, this is a very substantial electoral result, a democratic result on the purely electoral level. <clears throat> now, the liberal deficits. 
there are, when we when when uh, political scientists especially political theorists talk about standard liberal freedoms they talk about freedom of expression freedom of religious practice and freedom of association sometimes a great deal more but at least these three freedoms are called liberal freedoms and they're extremely important for democracy between elections and india's record on these freedoms not as is not as strong as its electoral record these freedoms are not absent, but they are not robustly anchored. So threats repeatedly appear. It's not, uh, it's not true of only the last two years. Threats repeatedly appear, appear, but this is especially true of the last years, last two years, and it's worsening, and I'll explain why. Mm. Now, India is at its freest at the time of elections. Short of inciting violence, virtually any argument can be made in election campaigns. But once an elected government takes over, it often places restrictions on basic liberal liberties. Intellectuals, writers, artists, students, and non-governmental organizations can face harassment on grounds that they hurt the sentiments of certain groups or undermine national interest. In a multi-religious society, which has had a deeply hierarchical system for, for centuries, some group or the other can always claim to be hurt. And when the, the, the claim of injury, group injury, is made, Indian polity does not defend the intellectual, does not defend the writer, does not defend the artist, does not defend the student, does not defend the NGO. It bans the book. It bans the speaker. So um, uh, it ban the ban on Rushdi satanic verses was placed first in India. Uh, the departure of M.F. Hussain, a leading painter, a famous painter of India, um, took place because Hindu right objected to his paintings of Hindu goddesses. And satanic verses was, was banned because Muslim right objected to Salman Rushdie's depiction of the prophet. Mm -hmm. um, and this happened both dur this happened, uh, during Cong the Congress regime. BJ BJP was not involved. Mr. Modi's party was not involved in these decisions. But these problems become especially serious when Hindu nationalists come to power, as is true today. Why? A, because minorities get added to the list of targets automatically, not simply writers or artists. A Hindu-centric view of the nation leads to that. India for Hindu nationalists is a Hindu nation. India's constitution does not say that. India's constitution says Indian, Indian nation belongs to all religious and linguistic communities. Um, so that leads to non-Hindu minorities, 20% of India, becoming special and automatic targets of Hindu nationalists when they come to power. Second, uh, they also favor a more muscular nationalism, or what uh, uh, Michael Sandel the other day at Harvard called, describing Mr. Modi, uh, 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 as a bearer of hard-edged nationalism. Hmm? Hard-edged nationalism which threatens to exclude dissenters, even legitimate dissenters. And here are some examples of that, <clears throat> some iconic examples. Very soon after Mr. Modi came to power, his group, um, not exactly his party, but the mother group is called the RSS. The mother group started, which led to the birth of BJP, um, mother group started a campaign called Gharwapsi, reconversion of Muslims and Christians uh, back to Hinduism. Most Muslims and Christians of India were converted um, um, centuries ago, um, and they were originally Hindus, as, as the argument goes. And this campaign was launched to forcibly convert them back. Hmm? Luckily, it was dropped. But after it was dropped, we had the infamous Dadiri lynching. What was this lynching about? A, ma a Muslim man, 58 year old, was suspected to have eaten beef or, or, have, or, or have beef in his fridge. Hmm? As a result of which, a mob, a Hindu nationalist mob, went to his house, lynched him to death, and lynched one of his sons also, who escaped, luckily, escaped death. That uh, was also dropped after a lot of criticism. Then a third campaign began, which was it's been called the Bharat Mata campaign, Mother India campaign, which insists that you, when demanded, should say, should uh, sing a victory anthem for Mother India. And if you do not sing a victory anthem of Mother India, a mob can be unleashed on you. 
and 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 uh, there are there are legislators from assemblies who've been tossed out not simply average citizens legislators from assemblies who refuse to say bharat mata ki jai victory to mother india hmm? tossed out of the assembly um, now india scores of course now the bharat mata campaign is still underway and probably will lead to a lot of vigilante violence all of this leads to a lot of vigilante violence groups are privileged to go and attack dissenters. And the government does not stop that. Hmm? The government does not stop that. Another example, when uh, uh, the leader of India's, student leader of India's uh, um, major, India's perhaps leading university, Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, was present in a meeting which was discussing um, the, the fate of Kashmir in India. And some people ended up saying India should, India should break up in pieces. He did not say that. But some people did say that in the meeting. He was charged with sedition and brought into uh, and a legal, the legal, the sedition case is still on. Not only that, when he was brought into, the, into Patiala court, about 200 lawyers attacked him physically. Lawyers are supposed to assume that he is, he is not guilty until proven guilty. But a hundred odd lawyers physically attacked him for disloyalty to the nation. And he, it was difficult to save him, actually, in a court of law, where the, the, the trial was about to begin. Now, the role of courts, of course, is extremely important. They are the final, they are the final institutional repository, if you will. Uh, for protecting basic civil freedoms in India. But the battle between executive and the, and the courts is always in the short to medium run weighed in favor of the executive. It takes time in a court of law to, to come to a judgment. It takes time to even file a, a, a suit. And not all of these people who are attacked have either the resources or the courage when faced with the mob to go to the court and seek redress. So the, the court versus executive prob, uh, problem in India is a serious one. Courts do protect in the end uh, in the civil freedoms, but it takes very long. It's expensive, and most people simply give up. Hmm? Now, why, um, why India has moved towards, uh, why India, India's liberal record is, is not as good as India's electoral record, it's, it will take us very far, and I'm happy to discuss. Um, but um, it would, perhaps in my last minute, I could say something about why uh, in the last two, three years, apart from the rise of Hindu nationalism, which is against, in many cases, minority rights, etc., why um, um, you have this new phase of mounting anxiety about liberal freedoms. First of all, a lot of Indians do believe, I can't give you as precise a set of uh, a data set as, as, as uh, Margaret produced, but we, we, are, we are doing the survey and we should be able to give you very good data very soon. First of all, a lot of Indians believe that India's parliament has become entirely unproductive. And a charismatic leader is needed to solve the institutional stalemate. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't have much regard for institutions. He is to be welcomed, and given the institutional um, uh, stalemate that that has appeared in the last uh, few years. Second, a lot of Indian be Indians believe, have or increasingly believe that that too much democracy ends up protecting minorities and hurts the majority community. <clears throat> hurts the majority community. And finally, a lot of Indians believe that too much democracy, especially non-electoral democracy protecting civil freedoms, civil rights, ends up undermining national security. So uh, often an argument is heard about how commitment to civil rights and individual rights ends up under undermining India's national profile or national security or national strength. Hmm? Um, um, I don't have more time to, 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 to go into either these points or some more points, but these three in my view, are the reasons for the surprising popularity of Mr. Modi as prime minister, despite the fact that, that um, some people have been lynched for eating beef, despite the fact that an, um, a man who's not yet pronounced guilty has been attacked in a court of law by lawyers, 
and has been charged for sedition, for, and despite not having uttered anything, anything that could be construed as anti-national, or and 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 a very credible threat was made for forcible conversions of 25,000 Muslims on 25th December and Christians on 25th December of 2014. A threat, luckily, not delivered, because that would have been quite dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. Ajit. Yes. Okay. Good morning. Now to make you even more depressed, in a, glo in a more global context, let's try and be even more depressed in a more global context. Let's question the question, because that's always fun. So it's the populists who are threatening democracy. This is what Margaret said. Now, I agree with that, but I also think it might not be the best way of looking at what's going on. That is not what I said. I'm interpolating as <laughs> for what you said at the end, that populists have a consequence which will be to populist. undermine. Well, I'm saying populists. <laughs> <laughs> and this slide changer won't work. But that's never mind. Let's try and do it this way. There we go, okay. Some evidence for this proposition. You know, you've got Trump, yes. You've also got Sanders, right. You've got Corbyn in Britain taking over the Labour Party. You have Syriza on the left in Greece, of course, famously, and Podemos in Spain, Le Front National, of course, in France, or even in Germany now, super stable Germany. We have Alternative for Deutschland. We have Sinn Féin in Ireland. All of these parties fragmenting the party system, eating away at the middle. Over the past six major European elections, the combined vote share of the centre-left and the centre-right, the traditional bulwarks of democracy, has fallen below 50%. And the US has Trump going up in the polls. If a picture paints a thousand words, this is the one you need to look at. This is from a friend of mine called Branko Milanovic, who writes wonderful books on global inequality. I do recommend them to you. So, if you have a look at the uh, bottom here, what you've got is the global income distribution. So if you're in the 5 to 15th percentile over the past, well, 1990 to 2008, your real income's gone up a lot. If you're in, <laughs> if you're in Sudan or Côte d'Ivoire, you've actually seen really large income gains. And if you go all the way up to where China is, kicking around, what's that, Ed, around 35th percentile to about 45th yeah. percentile, I mean, yeah, and that's a big story, 400 million people out of poverty over that period, incredible, right? Uh, but when you get to the 55th, that's where the American middle classes start. Like the poorest person in the United States is on the 50th percentile of the global income distribution. So have a look at 55 to 65 to 75 to 82. That's the American and generally speaking Western European middle classes. And they have taken an absolute pummeling in terms of their income over the past 30 years. Now have a look at their tail as it goes up from the 85th percentile to the 90th percentile to the 99th percentile. They did really well, didn't they? What happened to US middle class jobs? Well, that's manufacturing on the top line and that's productivity on the other. So there's a story here that says, well, you're becoming more productive. You substitute capital for labor. You don't need those people to work those awful jobs. I don't know why we keep <laughs> celebrating them. We should be doing something else. And that's the story we told ourselves all the way through the 1990s and indeed over the last 20 or 30 years. And there's definitely something to this because it was all globalization's fault, right? It would have <laughs> happened anyway, right? But you know, the funny thing is that has, you know, globalization, we think it's, you know, Tom Friedman, technical change, you know, just, just happened, right? Well, let's think about NAFTA. Seven years of negotiations by hundreds of lawyers, lobbyists, and politicians, 393 pages long. Yeah, that just happened. Totally. That, that, that just happened. Absolutely right. The WTO, 60 agreements over 10 years, 550 pages of legal agreements binding what citizens, corporations, and firms can and cannot do in the global economy. EMU, European Monetary Union, fantastic. <laughs> Dozens of treaties and agreements between 1992 and 2006, none of them voted on directly by Europeans themselves. And any time they had a referendum to disagree with anything that Brussels wanted, they had another referendum until they got the answer right. <laughs> and in the Euro crisis, let's remember that two democratically elected governments were deposed by the Europeans from Brussels and Berlin and from the European Central Bank. And technocrats were put in their place. These were constitutional coup d'etats in democracies in the heart of Europe. 
And when we had the Scottish independence referendum, the entire British establishment lined up and linked arms to say, please don't do this, it'll be terrible. And the Scots said, oh, all right then, we won't this time. But now it looks like the Brits are out. And do the Brits really care about Europe? Or are they basically fed up of basically having their elites mansplain them to the what they should want? What they think is good, because it's been good for them. But as I showed you on that slide earlier, it hasn't been good for the majority of people in these countries. <coughs> so why should they believe a single word people like me say? Let's have a look at this one. This is Thomas Piketty's data. This is, of course, the growth in the income of the top 1% of the United States and then in Europe in this slide. And there's a slide that looks really similar. It's funny, though, isn't it? What's this one? Uh, this is hourly compensation. As you can see, beginning in 2003, it basically went completely flat. Right? Real income gains don't happen anymore. But productivity goes up. Now, if you do an economics class, they always tell you marginal productivity theory of wages, right? You get paid according to how productive you are, which explains why bankers get paid so much, because they're obviously <laughs> 120,000 times more productive than anybody else in the world. I mean, that obviously makes sense, right? But there's a relationship here that's obvious, because basically when you have more and more productivity and compensation for the vast majority remains constant, where's all the money going? Maybe people are beginning to figure this out. What do you think? So is democracy under threat? Let's remember Hayek on this topic. It's my favorite quote from Hayek. We have no intention, however, of making a fetish of democracy. Democracy is essentially a means, a device for safeguarding internal peace and individual freedom. So we have to decide what democracy is. Is democracy just a means to an end? Is it a process? And I kind of like that definition because it's very clean. It's very simple. Because what it says is, if you lose this time, you get to come back and try again, right? There's no winner takes all. There's no sort of Game of Thrones, you know, win it or you die, right? That's the nice thing about democracy. It's a process. You can lose the argument. You can lose the election. You can come back the next time. But ultimately, if you take a sort of a Hayekian liberal, and I mean that in terms of the classical liberal set of principles, democracy is not an end because those ends can be, as John Stuart Mill said, vulgar, base, they can be ruled by passion rather than interest. And in fact, if you leave, according to John Stuart Mill, the vast majority to make decisions, there will be a huge regression to the mean in taste and in vulgarity. And we will end up electing clods. And we will vote ourselves each other's property. And society will break down. So liberalism is a supporter of democracy, but as process, not as outcome. Now, there's a guy called Karl Polyani. Karl Polyani was a Hungarian refugee writing at the same time as Hayek. And he wrote a book in 1944, at the same time he wrote his most famous book, The Road to Serfdom, called The Great Transformation. And in The Great Transformation, he said, whenever we try to make markets, we forget that they don't come out of the ground and they're not given by God. It's just like globalization. The entire architecture of globalization depends upon legal treaties. When we talk about financial markets and people trading derivatives, we forget these are legal contracts. These are things made by men and women. Now, what Pagliani pointed out was when you liberalize, to use our contemporary language, when you privatize, integrate, when you create global supply chains, when you outsource, when you do all these things, the people who get hurt by this do not get automatically compensated. And when they figure out that they're never going to be compensated, they invent a democracy. And then they come after the people who have done this to them through the ballot box. There's no guarantee that you get a nice outcome. There's no guarantee that you end up with a nice New Deal order with a little bit of redistribution. Let's remember that Adolf Hitler was voted into power. And at the 1934 election, the Nazis got 43.1% of the vote. This is something that Margaret had already mentioned. This is Marty Gillen's flat line of policy and ir irresponsiveness. What you've got over here is the probability of policy <coughs> change. And the green one, the first slide is low income. So basically, if you're under $50,000 a year, there's a 0.3 chance that anybody on Congress will take up what you want and do anything about it. But then look what happens when you scale it up to high income. <coughs> now, here's the fascinating story about his book. It's really worth reading. Um, from a couple of years ago, uh, Inequality and Democracy, is it? Is what it's called? Affluence and Influence. Affluence and Influence, that's what it's called. And the wonderful thing about the book is he points out that the, the government in contemporary American history, which in a sense paid the most attention to affluent preferences and the least attention to poor, well, average people's preferences, was Lyndon Baines Johnson. 
Isn't that strange, right? Now, here's another, another interesting one. Guess which president was the best at listening to low-income preferences and going against high-income preferences? George W. Bush. Yes, isn't that extremely odd, <laughs> right? Now, throw that back into that world with that slide that I showed you, where you basically see the middle income of the middle classes collapsing. And then think about why you get Trump. There's no mystery. Think about why you get Jeremy Corbyn. Think about why you get this. You remember these two guys? Alexis Tsipras, Yanis Varoufakis. They were Syriza. They're the guys that were elected in Greece. They said, no more austerity, we've had enough. And fair enough, I mean, basically, they had eaten away 30% of the country's economy. It was a disaster. It's the worst episode of policy making you could possibly imagine. And we're going to have more of it. So just keep going. Now, they were elected because every single electoral district in Greece said, no, we're not doing this. Right? They got 61% of a vote in a referendum that says, we're not signing up to a new bailout. It's killing us. Does anybody know who the guy on the right is? Jason Blum, exactly. Can you tell me who he is, sir? He's the head of finance minister of the EU. Yes. So um, he runs something called the Eurogroup. The Eurogroup has no constitutional basis in law in Europe. It is essentially an ad hoc meeting of finance ministers. And the first time those two guys met, he said to this one, if you don't do exactly what we want, we're going to starve your banks of liquidity and shut down your country. Three months later, that's what happened. OK, if that's the case, is it the populists that are threatening democracy, or is it the technocrats that are strangling it and causing a reaction which brings you Trump and brings you all of the other nice things that come with it? Thank you. I hope this gives you a sense of why I love my job, being surrounded by <laughs> scholars like this. We have a little bit of time for questions, so let's open it up. Yes? Uh, so you've each done a really good job of, of telling us what the problem is. Um, yeah, you've each done a very good job of uh, telling us what the problem is in the U.S. and in Europe and in India. Um, how do we get people to not vote against their best interests? And if that's not the solution, what is? <clears throat> Who wants to go first? <laughs> Margaret goes first. <laughs> <clears throat> so let me think about this. Um, I mean, I think the first thing is that people need to vote because one <clears throat> aspect of this sort of non responsiveness, et cetera, is declining participation. So that would be one thing. And of course, it's a political strategy to expand and contract the electorate in the United States to try to achieve whatever your political goals are. So we are having a contention about that now. Um, you know, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that really leaders, in, and I would say this about both parties, although I, you know, I think Trump is a distinctive problem, is that there, and, and this is where, I mean, I do agree with Mark, and the reason that I, I challenged him on that populist is that people on the, in both sides of the political spectrum are feeling the effects of trade. And it was an elite consensus that trade was a good thing and in the long term everybody would do well. <coughs> people don't live in the long term, they live in the short term. And so I think attentiveness to the, to the economic problems that face, especially certain part declining parts of this country. There was some evidence that showed that Trump voters were strongest <coughs> in places like around here, you know, the New Bedford area, et cetera, places that have had a lot of economic problems and due to trade. So, I mean, I think that the answer is more government uh, attention to economic uh, vitality in parts of the country that have really lost that economic vitality, um, and, as well as as well as more engagement. Because I'll just say one one thing that struck me in those those numbers that I saw was how younger people are feeling sort of you know like they're not so engaged with democracy. 
bringing young people in and making sure they have a stake, I think, is the other thing that I think is critical. Um, I don't think those who are supporting Modi think that they voted against their interest. I don't think so. Um, and they may throw him out three years from now. We don't know. Um, but um, um, it would certainly help uh, if we could find a way to make parliament work better so that um, the executive or, or this desire for a charismatic leader doesn't become so intense, strong, and pronounced. Um, and some of us are certainly trying to, f to find an intellectually creative way of coming up with proposals to make parliament work better. Uh, it will be a struggle, but, uh, but uh, a lot of thought is going into it. Second, um, I don't know about the other charismatic leaders that we're discussing here or you know, that I don't know about whether I don't know whether this would apply to Trump, but Modi in particular cares about international opinion. He wants to be seen in the highest uh, forums and in the most celebrated corridors. He you know, wants to be seen hugging Obama. And Mr. Obama, by writing uh, an article in Time magazine celebrating his rise from being a tea seller's son to Prime Minister of India, uh, Mr. Obama has written a 600-word essay on Modi for, on, in Time magazine. Now, I can't persuade Mr. Obama to start criticizing Modi on, for these failings. But if international opinion started focusing on these failings rather than India's role vis-a-vis -vis China, right? then I think you can once again see some changes. But that's also, uh, there you have a, a, a judgment about democratic vitality clashing with the judgment about security imperatives. right? And uh, look at what's happening to Turkey, for example. Uh, the, e the European leaders are not criticizing Erdogan for attacking civil rights, mm -hmm. for attacking the press, but they want his cooperation because of the refugee crisis. This is how they have defined it. So you have these, these conflicting multiple objectives. And in the end, of course, uh, this is something I couldn't talk about. One great promise of, of Mr. Modi is economic um, strengthening of India, right? a Chinese-style growth rate as opposed to Indian-style growth rate was always second for the last 20 years. Quite high, but second China. Um, if he can't deliver on that, one, the, those who voted for him, not on ideological grounds, on grounds that he represents them, represents their interests, represents their aspirations, will also not vote for him. But uh, it's not, there's no easy solution to this. Uh, because these are all institutional questions, and institutional questions evade easy solutions. <laughs> Let's do another question. All right. <clears throat> Brian. Thank you, and thank you for that, uh, the panel's uh, contribution to this. This is on everyone's mind, so it's an appropriate time to do this. I love the Hayek quote, but I've heard of another one, which is that democracy is a journey and not a destination, uh, which is the same basic point, that it's a process. And democracy is not an ideology either despite the fact that it's been often described that way, it, it can encompass many ideologies. And uh, it seems to me that as you look at the process and what it produces in terms of policy, you look at three aspects of policy, social policy, economic policy, and foreign policy for any country. And uh, where we have, I think, been failing in this country is that we've made a political issues out of social policy. Uh, the latest one being the bathroom uh, issues. Uh, and that's very troublesome because once you mix uh, religious values with uh, policy questions, it seems to me you're, you're, you're uh, is basically creating problems uh, for the democracy. I'd like to just uh, ask one other question with respect to uh, the development perspective. If uh, I happen to have something to do with a donor agency at one point, in my for, career. For the audience, uh, Brian Atwood is a senior fellow here at Watson, and in his, many things in his distinguished career, among many things, Brian ha had led USAID. Um, when you look at democracy from the perspective of uh, a development professional, you're looking at two aspects. 
One is participation. Uh, it's very difficult to achieve development results if people aren't participating actively in the society. Uh, this goes to the book that uh, Chimoglu and Robinson wrote, mm -hmm. Why Nations Fail, when governments become extractive as opposed to involving the people in these decisions. And the second issue is accountability. Mm -hmm. And if, it seems to me if we lose both the ability to see people participating in their society and the accountability of government, we've lost a lot. I'm not sure that the United States is yet in that position. We'll have to wait <laughs> till the next election to see that. But many developing countries, including India, are very much uh, involved uh, in that. And I think India's success in development has been the result of its democracy. But maybe the panelists would uh, comment on some of these, these observations. Thank you. Mark? Uh, it's a bit off my reservation. I um, mean, my general comment on this is that, you know, if you look at the, the very positive aspects of the, the past 30 years rather than the negative aspects, if you put this in a wider frame and think of it as a story of global development, then essentially after World War II, the rich countries of the world were obscenely rich in comparison to everyone else. And what's happened through trade and through other processes is a leveling out, right? So if you want China to be China, if you want to that to then to China to turn from exports into a huge consumption economy, which would actually power growth throughout the whole global economy, then they have to get richer. And a correlate of that is that the wage premium that you have in the West is going to go down. That, that's just going to happen. Now, when you turn around and say that, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm a brown professor, right? I mean, I can't be fired unless I do something egregious, right? And uh, I've got tenure, there you go, right? And I sit in a very nice income and I live in the nicest country in the world and I'm a citizen and all that. I'm telling other people that your wage premium needs to go down and we call it global development. And, and I wonder why they want to kick me in the head, right? <laughs> and that's when the politics comes into this, and quite rightly so, because who the hell am I to say that that has to happen? And what politics and what democracy is all about, to use another famous quote, is the art of the possible. And the art of the possible is to take the impossible today and make it possible tomorrow. Now, what terrifies me about Trump is he gets that. He really, you, that's nonsense, you can't do that. I know, but by pushing it this far, I can get there. You can't even get there. So I don't think he's actually going to do a Joe Stalin and try and actually physically deport 11 million people, which is the last person who tried to do something as insane as that. But I think he's going to make life very, very uncomfortable for millions of Americans. And he'll get away with that because he understands that democracy and politics is the art of the possible. And if people like me sit around saying, well, it's development, yeah, I'm afraid you guys in the Rust Belt have to take a hit, maybe you can get a job at Walmart. They're going to vote for him. Simple as that. Uh, see, uh, yes, in the back. Yeah. Um, this is fabulous. Um, so, and the question I have for all of you is, um, it was fabulous. And the question I have is, it seems to, seems to me, hearing you all, that we've all become liberal couch potatoes. We've sort of, you know, we're sitting there and we somehow expect ideas of liberalism and democracy and development to carry us forward, and it's not. And it's not, not just because of the poorly educated who are supporting Trump, but it's also because they're increasingly the educated who seem to be supporting Trump or supporting characters in Austria and Germany and Absolutely. certainly in India and so on. So what role does education have in this? How do we, do we think about reframing education? Or do we, should we? Um, how do we handle this? And what role do we have to get people to think differently? Yeah. I'm going to ask for very quick answers from the panel so we can get some more questions in. Uh, Margaret? I mean, yes, this is part of our job. This is the job description, right? You know, we bring students here and we try and turn them into good citizens to do good in the world. That's, the, you know, the thing. And, you know, you've got to think about the micro incentives on this, right? So uh, before 2000, in 2006, 40% of MIT grads, right, who are primarily engineering and related disciplines, went straight into finance. Why? Because that's where the money is. Right? Now, they're not engineering our way out of global warming. They're engineering more and more complex derivatives, which is zero sum ways of arbitraging money they don't have. Right? So, you know, if that, that's not socially productive, but it's personally incredibly remunerative. Now, we can educate people all you want, we can turn out really smart people. But if the incentive structure of the world is such that the top talent is just going to go, well, I could do that for $30,000 or I could make $3 million, they're gone. 
So we need to have something more than education, a project to believe in, perhaps sort of terrifyingly a threat that we need to face up to, which I think is climate change, which we really don't focus on to the extent that we need to. But something needs to change more than just our ability on the micro level to produce good citizens. That's insufficient. I think we also need to recognize the very complex relationships between development, accountability, and education. My own area of expertise is in, in China. And while I'm no great fan of the Chinese government, I will say that many middle class Chinese feel at least the central government in China is highly accountable and performs well, put their faith in that, and may feel that that government is somehow delivering liberal values. Therefore, they don't really need democracy for the time being. And while I'm not particularly an advocate, for that position, that is a position of many highly educated people who are living an experience of a pretty good life, or one much better than they, they, they lived mm -hmm. just years earlier. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, it seemed to me, and I would ask the panel if they would agree, uh, that the threat to liberal democracy comes from both sides, uh, as much from Mr. Obama, who says he has a pen and a phone, as it does uh, from Mr. Trump. Uh, but I would also like to extrapolate that a little bit and talk very quickly about the concern that we are ruled by passion rather than interest and what role social media will play in that in the forthcoming election. Yeah, on, on the Trump-Obama question, you know, I think part of the uh, I, I've heard I heard this uh, people saying you know Trump is like Obama, um, and that comes from thinking of Obama as someone uh, through the exec doing things through the executive order, and I have to say that I think the issue is a division within the Republican Party, and that part of the Republican Party doesn't want to compromise. It has particular beliefs and doesn't want to compromise. And that you saw this conflict between John Boehner on the one hand and uh, the, um, the Tea Party uh, group, I'm forgetting their name, in Congress. And that has made it hard for compromise to happen in Congress. And I have to say Obama was going to compromise in 2011 on things that I thought were a really bad idea. Boehner and Obama had this compromise that they were going to do around Social Security. But I think it's the failure to compromise uh, that has led Obama to do the executive order. And I would say there is a difference between Obama and Trump and in the, uh, the demonizing of, uh, of outsiders and the demonizing of people that are different that I, that I think is, is really significant for American uh, democracy. So. Quickly on the social media thing, I, th I think this is incredibly important. What technology enables you to do, and all the psychological work on the show is this clearly now, is to be far more mean to someone online than you'd ever be face to face. And if the background noise is one just of unremitting hostility, cyberbullying, and all the rest of that stuff, which is incredibly damaging, particularly to young people, you're, you're creating damage, you're creating long-term psychological trauma in populations. I think we need to take this very, very seriously. Now, of course, freedom of speech, what do you do with that? Do you ban Twitter? Well, there will immediately be something else that will take it. And also, these tools are double-edged. Twitter's fantastic. You can get news out. You can organize. It's a wonderful tool. But it's also very, very dangerous in terms of what it does, I think, particularly to young people's psyches. So again, no easy answer to this one. But the long-term consequences for politics, I think, are absolutely profound. And we're just beginning to grapple with them. Mr. Modi is the, is the most efficient user of social media that Indian politics has seen. He does not want to talk to traditional press directly and he uh, broadcasts his messages through his Twitter account. He has, I think at this point, um, not, we're not talking about 2 million followers, we're talking about 30, 40 million followers. So there's a direct communication about what he's doing, where he's going, what he's thinking. Um, and, um, and I think we, we are not yet clear about what s the implications of social media are for democratic process. I think this will be a very important subject to study. I'll also say, uh, although it's not well portrayed in the American media, the social media landscape in China is incredibly vibrant. Mm. But I think what it does is it encourages people to, to behave as individual operators, even news generators, but they don't organize mm -hmm. 
across. They're so busy um, uh, producing information individually. Now, of course, there are huge barriers to organizing across, but in some ways, at least in some circumstances, a, a rich social media life could be an important uh, underpinning of authoritarianism as much as democracy. We have time for one last question. Yes. That is and how that is contributing to um, a lot of the conversation outside of campuses, the lack of willingness to um, allow dissenting voices on campus. Um, and I'm sure you're all nodding, and et cetera, but I'm interested in your opinion about that and how that then translates into the broader population. And who wants to step into that main field? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. No. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret is new to Brown, so she has a fresh perspective. <laughs> That's what guys do. Um, Guilty. Guilty. I think it's a huge problem, and I think it has something to do with the removal of campuses from the real world and the more engagement with the real world and more diverse kinds of people allows people to see different perspectives. I, so, I, I mean, it's... It, it is, this is true, I came from UC Berkeley, big public, diverse public university. I'm not saying UC Berkeley hasn't had its moments of political correctness, but um, it's, I, to me, it looks a little bit like a tempest in the teapot, like a little enclosed world. And I don't doubt that people's concerns and things they feel are real, but for me, it's always an how do you open out, how do you engage more broadly in the community, and what do you learn from that, rather than something that's inward looking. It's, that's my perspective I, I would on just it. add, uh, of course these issues um, are very sensitive on campuses, including at Brown, but I, I think there is a big upside. Just speaking for myself, I grew up as a privileged citizen in, in the U.S., and, and I learned a particular narrative of what my country's history is. And maybe that narrative is correct, maybe not, but I think the recent discussions about incarceration, about policing in, in uh, minority communities, that's forced me to rethink what that narrative is and the validity of that narrative that I learned. And while it doesn't encourage me to, to abandon liberal values, traditional liberal values, it does, I think, force a number of us to ask to what extent our country, whichever country we happen to come from, to what extent are our countries really meeting the values that we claim to be meeting. And, and, and if, it, if the discourse on campus forces that kind of reconsideration, fine. That's appropriate. That's what an intellectual life should be, and that's what a civically engaged life should be. On that note, I want to thank you all and thank our wonderful <laughs> Please join us. We have a brunch outside uh, following this event. Thank you all. <laughs>